Good morning, Grace Kids families, and welcome to another Grace Kids Devotion Moment here at Grace Baptist Church. We are thrilled that you're able to join us this morning on our Grace Kids Connect page on YouTube. Uh, as I said, it's an exciting moment for me to be able to jump into our second ever episode, but specifically our first one, we're actually doing our Bible reading. I hope a lot of you that are watching this took advantage of this opportunity to, to learn and grow together with our devotional series. This past week, we wrapped up, I shouldn't say wrapped up, we made through most of the book of James. Next week, we'll wrap up James, and we'll also jump into 1 Peter as well. Whenever we read a book of the Bible, it's important for us to understand the context. So as I go through these, I plan on giving context to give you a little deeper understanding of, just for our kids, a basic level of, okay, who wrote it? Why was it written? Who are they writing to? We're going to go along those lines. So we're going to look at this right here. First thing is, who wrote this book? Well, as is usually the case, look at the name and we see it's James. Now, usually that's who they're writing to or who is writing it. In this case, it's who is writing this, okay? So it's written by James, but which James is it? There's a few James in the Bible. The one that we would say it was most likely is the half-brother of Jesus, James. Uh, he's actually taken on more of a leadership role in the New Testament period. If you were to look in the book of Acts, you see that James becomes one of the leaders of the church of Jerusalem. In this New Testament era, he's now a leader in the church. So this is very important. He's a critical part of the picture. Now, when did James come to Christ? Well, as far as we can tell, again, looking at Scripture, he didn't come to Christ until after the resurrection. He didn't come to salvation until after the resurrection had happened. Because previously, he didn't really have a belief in him. It said that in a passage that his own family didn't know him. They didn't truly believe him. We're sure that Mary and Joseph on their own realm, they understood Jesus on a different level because... They were around Christ the rest of their entire life, and they had been visited by the angels before he was even born. So they had an understanding that their own children just didn't grasp a hold of. So James was in that category. But he comes to this new faith in Christ. He's taken on a leadership role, and he's written this book of the Bible. Who is he writing to? Well, he was writing to the Jewish believers. It says that he was writing to the 12 tribes. And so he's trying to uh, send it out to those people. You see that at the beginning of the verse here. It says in, in verse 1-1, one, one, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad's greeting. So he's writing to those 12 tribes specifically. His passage, it doesn't mean that if we read this, oh, well, it's written to 12 tribes and I'm not Jewish, so it doesn't mean something to me. That's not what it's exactly saying. What it means, is it still applies to us as Christians, but specifically he's writing to these people because he's trying to give them an understanding of this New Testament period. This is new to them. It's revolutionary. They have been following the law up to this point, specifically saying, if we follow by this precepts and, and we love God and we keep all these things holy, as long as we do these things, well, God will bless us in the end and, and we'll get to heaven. And it's it's changing times. Sacrificial laws have changed. The moral laws have never changed, but sacrificially, dietary, what they eat, all that had changed. So he's trying to reach them and help them understand where do we stand today as Christians? And that's his goal behind this. So he's writing to those people. And then why is he writing this? Why is he writing this? Well, the way I look at this is it's a practical proverb of Christianity. So if you look at the book of Proverbs, which is still applicable today, right? God's word is timeless. It's something that means something to us today. This is what many people would say the New Testament book of Proverbs is, is the book of James. You look at it as just multiple things that we as Christians should abide by. Many things that we should apply to our own lives. The one thing we can see through this is that it's faith plus action equals the complete Christian life. Let me say it one more time. The book of James is saying here's faith and here's the action of that faith and that equals a complete Christian life. And that's what takes us to our key passage that we read earlier this week. Let's turn to James chapter 2. If you have it already open, you can look at that right now. James chapter 2, verse 17 and 18 specifically. We'll read that. Even so, faith. If it hath not works, 
is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is none God that doest thou well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Think about that passage. That's the key passage that James is really trying to push to us. He's trying to help us understand because it's talking about a lot of works based. If you look at the story, the history of James, Martin Luther, a very famous theologian, he wasn't as fond of the book of James because he felt like it was very works based. He's trying to help people understand that works is not what gets us to heaven. Don't put your faith in that. That's He's trying to make sure people understand that. And here's this book of James that's saying that, wait a minute, if I don't do works, then I don't have faith. And so it was really confusing and hard for him to understand. So he wasn't as fond of the book of James. But here's what we have to understand. What James is trying to tell us is faith is critical. It's part of it. In fact, if we were to continue on here in James chapter 2, it talks about Abraham. That Abraham had faith, but he proved his faith by what he had done. It wasn't his works that got him to heaven. It wasn't his works that gave him that faith. But because he had a faith in God to go and accomplish things. Remember we talked about Abraham uh, in our Grace Kids uh, faith series where we talked about um, the heroes of the faith and we talked about Abraham and he got up out of the land and he went to a new place. He left the land he was familiar with and he went. And he came to a point where he had his only son that was promised to him. And now all of a sudden, oh no, this son, you're going to take him from me? I have to sacrifice him? And he had to put this faith well, to prove his faith, he had to do something in the process. It wasn't that that action was actually him uh, earning his rights. No, he was living out his faith. And that's what James is trying to say is, show me your faith without works and I'll show you something that's dead. It's, it's dead. If you are not living out your life in a practical way that I am doing something, I'm taking action in my life because I love God so much. Because as James says right here, a servant of God, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, that I am a bond servant. I am going to, out of love for him and what he's done for me, I'm going to serve him. If we are not putting action behind that, what good is that? If you were to tell your parents, yeah, I love my mom and dad, but then you never obey them, you never listen to them, you never do anything for them, how are you supposed to know that they love you or that you love them? How are you proving your love to them? And that's what we're seeing here in the Bible is James is trying to add this up. Now, a lot of this book of James is kind of an addition problem because what he wants us to achieve is a complete Christian life. So what I like to picture is almost like a necklace. Have you ever guys made a necklace before? I know there's a few here in the class. They've made necklaces before. And if you add to that necklace and you have just one bead on it, well, it looks kind of incomplete, right? Ever seen, well, maybe your moms have a pearl necklace or a grandmother's a pearl necklace. What if it just had one pearl on it? Is it complete? Well, no. It may be complete, but uh, uh, most pearl necklaces I've seen have multiple beads or strands on them. And so what the object is, the objective right here is what... James is trying to tell us, you have to add on those beads to create a complete masterpiece. So we see in, in the Bible, it says that we've read so far, rejoice in trials. We should rejoice in trials. That's a way to prove out our faith, that I have faith in God. I'm going to rejoice in my trials. I'm going to resist temptation. Add that bead to our necklace. I'm going to serve others with compassion. Those that are in need, I'm going to give to them. That's another bead on there. Speak with love and care to other people. That's adding another bead onto it. Because James focuses a lot on speech that we've read through. He wants us to be careful in what we say. And so that's another bead that you uh, connect to it. And the last thing I also wrote down here is living in love and unity with other brothers in, in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be loving. And if we are able to add all those beads on, now we have a complete masterpiece. And that's what he's trying to tell us is brothers and sisters of Christ, those of the 12 tribes, we need to do a better job 
of making a complete Christian faith. So my question for you today is, are you building your masterpiece? Are you building that masterpiece today? Or would you say, nah, I'm good enough? Because if we're trying to build our masterpiece, the book of James is perfect for that. He just named out all these things that we can work on and grow. You may say, well, I'm really good at showing love and care to other people, but oh, I really struggle with my speech. I struggle with what I say to other people. I struggle with saying things that I probably shouldn't say to other people. Or you know what? I'm, I do pretty well when things are really difficult. I can all point to God, always point to God and say, man, I'm following him. I'm doing what's right. But I struggle with resisting temptation. There's points where there's things I just cannot say no to. Oh, man, these are things I got to work on. And let me tell you, you're not alone. All of us struggle with those things. So my hope for you guys today is build that masterpiece. If I can leave you with one more illustration. When I was a kid, I loved collecting baseball cards. Maybe some of you like the same. Loved collecting baseball cards. But what always bothered me is when you bought those pack of cards and you would look on the back and it's like one of 400. And you're like, man, I have all these other cards that I want to, I want to build a complete set. I want this complete set of cards, but I don't know how else I can do it. So the way I did it, and it's not cheating because I really, and I, I loved getting the complete sets. So when I was a kid, I would just buy the complete set of cards because Going out and buying a pack of cards, there's something intriguing about that. It's, it's man, I, there's an unknown. You don't know what's in that set of cards. But I liked having that complete set that I knew I wasn't missing anything. Are you trying to build your complete set today? Are you making an invested effort and in saying, I am going to make my faith work? I'm going to prove my love to Christ by what I do. I'm going to show love and compassion to other people. I'm going to speak the right way. I'm going to be a part of love and unity with other people around me. They may not agree with me all the time, but I'm going to show love to them. Are you building that today? If not, let's work on that today. So what I want to do is I'm going to close with a word of prayer. This is something I would love for us to do in the future. I'm going to close in prayer and then we will sign off. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence, to learn from your word. Thank you for the book of James that you gave us. I pray that you'll continue to work in these kids' lives to build the complete set, to finish their masterpiece, that they will add bead after bead after bead and have a complete Christian life. We're so grateful for this challenge that you gave us in your word. We're thankful for who you are and what you accomplish in us and you will continue to do in our lives today. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen. All right, everybody, I will see you next week. Lord willing, I'll see you on Sunday and then we'll also be back on Wednesday. Again, Lord willing, we'll be together. And next Friday, we're going to keep doing it, keep rolling along here. We're going to finish up the book of James, and we're going to jump into the book of 1 Peter and give the context to that as well. Thank you so much again for joining us today. You all have a great day. Pastor Scott signing off. I'll see you all later.